trigonometry. All right, evaluate the positional efficacy. Showed you these little jigs, and these are really brilliant, okay? You can use different jigs, different sizes, and do different ferrogometric tests to see which vertical dimension might help the patient. Vertical. So how would you know how much vertical to add? I mean, what would be a guide? Rolling the dice? Throwing a dart? Or maybe measuring? Well, how much? You're telling these people to open the vertical, but you're giving them no guide. A millimeter? Two millimeters? Three on odd days? Four on even days? See, it becomes arbitrary. And if you've never used the equipment, it's easy to, to speak negatively about it. Okay? So you can evaluate. I'm oh, sorry to get off. Excuse me, what do we do? But um, it isn't the end all. Why else would we use ferrogometry? All right? Evaluate the positional efficacy. Showed you these little jigs, and these are really brilliant. Okay? You can use different jigs, different sizes, and do different ferrogometric tests to see which vertical dimension might help the patient. Okay, maybe we need to add two million. Like, where's that uh, purse? Where's that appliance? Right there. Okay, I love this appliance because just throw it. You don't see Henry over here. <laughs> okay, this is a great appliance because not only can you advance the mandible through the expansion screw here, and if you if you let's say you use up all the expansion you need, all the advancement, you can put shims in here very easily. It, it has a lot of advantages. But let's say we find that by adding, say, two millimeters of acrylic in front, we might improve the collapsibility of the airway. Well, how easy is it to grind on this and add a couple millimeters of triad? We do that every day, probably one to five times a day in my office. We're playing with that vertical dimension. Is that substantive in terms of maximizing airway? Yeah, you've got AP, but you're also going to have vertical. So how would you know how much vertical to add? I mean, what would be a guide? Rolling the dice? Throwing a dart? Or maybe measuring? So we do this in Let It Deal or No Deal all the time. All right, take it home. So here's his sleep report. And this is his Embleta. And here's his phone number written at the top for me. Why? Because I'm going to have to call him. And it's just, he, we just write it on the top. And there it is. I'm going to call him and let him know. So here's Jim. Okay. And apneas, hypopneas, okay, we have 359.5 minutes of data, 80.5, 81.6 on his back, you know, so his AHI based on a take home is about 80, 81, right? Huh, okay. Uh, oxygen saturation, his average is 92, and he had 91 events, 91 desaturation events per hour, okay? Um, snored 11 percent, 10.9 percent of the time. Okay. Further on his report, here's the raw data. You know, what's really nice is the Ambleta uses the same software as a sleep lab. All right. I can take my Ambleta data. It's all Ambla, the Ambla software. If they want the, the raw data, which they like to see my raw data, you can just send it to them, and they can evaluate it using their software. You can't do that with a watch. I'm just being honest with you. I just, you know, I'm just. I'm like, I bought three. How many did you buy? Just bad. Luck. I mean, you're going to throw, what is it? 3%, 4%? Nothing I'm aware of. Not that you're aware of? That's what, that's what I've read. You also don't do it. But, well, well, you don't do it. Right. So it happened. Well, I caused zero, or I just passed it with my end. Just go. What's he doing? And he turned around right away. Well, he wants to see what? Well, he doesn't know what he's looking at. He wants to see it. Patients are affected dramatically by this instrumentation. Okay? I don't care what your opinion of the instrumentation is. Patients want to know what their numbers are. So we start doing this, and no one else in your community, let's say someone else in your community says they do oral appliances, all right? But they don't have instrumentation. I mean, and you do. Who's going to have the greater effect, just impact perception on the patient? You are. I mean, it, I mean, he whipped right around. Ed is so funny. Patients just, you know, okay, they want to see. And when you position your equipment, you have to be careful that they can't see the screen. Because you'll be right here, and they're kind of like, want to go over here and see the screen. Kind of hilarious. But again, the assistants do all this. All these tests have been done by my assistants. 
I get the printed it's copy it's brought to me when I'm in with the console. Okay. What is the blue line? Really? Worst case scenario. You've had no time to titrate him. Right. You've had no time for his airway to heal. You've done nothing other than arbitrarily open him up and move him forward. Mm -hmm. Have you done anything to fine tune this gentleman or let him heal? Remember, once you reduce the negative air pressure on the lumen of the, on the epithelium, it is going to do what? It is going to shrink, which will do what to the caliber of the airway? Open that up. So while what you're doing is, is you're comparing the absolute best case scenario to nearly the worst case scenario, and look at the result. Do you see a change in his airway? Did we tighten his sails by stabilizing his jaw, which in turn stabilizes his hyoid bone? All the related common criticism, but the Muller maneuver, meta maneuver, is a homologic maneuver, right? And it's been validated sitting up and lying down by medicine. This is not a dental maneuver. We don't have to explain this to our medical colleagues. This is their stuff. We're just measuring. Okay? And the advantage of this over the endoscope is we can look with an endoscope, we can measure the dynamic changes of the airway all the way down to the epiglottis. Would that be valuable if you're treating airway issues? Would you want to know if you had a genetically small airway? Would you want to know up front if you could make changes, just arbitrary changes in vertical and AP position and tighten up the sails? Would you want to know that? And we don't, I don't have a sleep bed in my office, so I mean it would be nice if I could do, here's your appliance, you know, let's do a sleep study. Come back in a month, you tighten, you push it forward, we'll do another sleep study. We'll do, it just isn't economically practical. I mean, the pediatricians argue that doing a sleep study on a child post TNA surgery is not economically feasible. So how are we going to do PSGs three or four times on our patients when we're doing the appliance? We can't. But what we can do is put an appliance in his mouth, and then six weeks from now when we have you back to check it, we can redo these tests. And how have we changed and altered the airway? And Bob's kid, Bob Workshover's kid, comes with these little shims. Two millimeters, three millimeters, four millimeters, and I've got a real burr up my butt. Because one of the old stirs from the Academy of Dental State Medicine said, this equipment had no value, but if your appliance isn't working, just increase the vertical dimension. Okay, uh, how much? How far? Well, just do it. Wait, there, no, there are no guides. With this, we actually, at the second and third follow-up appointment, also we schedule half an hour with one of my assistants who will use the shims and check different vertical changes in the appliance to see if we can maximize those numbers. Is it a golden position? No, but it is a trend. At least we can quantify what we're doing, and we can show, you know what? If I did increase the vertical two millimeters, we actually were able to increase his minimum by 10%. Would that be a value to you if you're working with these medical appliances? Absolutely it would. I mean, it's just, but the way it was originally taught was find the golden position at the first appointment, and you're done. Well, it's a, we now know it's a lot more dynamic than that. I mean, there's healing, there's titration, there's patient acclimatization to the appliance. There's all kinds of things you need to do, but you're going to use this pharyngometer just about every time the patient walks in the door. And again, doctors, how much time does it take you to do a pharyngometric evaluation? 